The Opium War is not really known in the West. It's not a war that is usually taught in our schools or part of our pop culture. But in China today, the Opium War is viewed as a crime and the beginning of the unequal treaties that imposed imperialism in greater and greater amounts. It's taught in schools in today's China. And there are monuments and locations where you could visit. Some of the characters from the period are considered heroes and others villains. That's not how the war has always been described. It wasn't even really considered a war by the Qing dynasty at the time. And it only made its way into the history lessons during the Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek in the 1920s. The People's Republic of China then continued to teach about it in its history lessons. It's now considered the opening chapter in the modernizing of China, the national humiliation, and an initial step towards the eventual Chinese Revolution. Under Qing Dynasty rules, Europeans who wanted to trade with China were restricted by the Canton system. Essentially, all foreign sea shipping had to occur through the port city of Guangzhou in southern China. Guangzhou is today's name for the city English speakers used to call Canton. Foreign traders could not enter the city and had to operate through seasonal factories along the harbor, just outside the city walls, and only during trading season. They then had to retreat to Portuguese-controlled Macau or further away during the winter non-trading season. Foreign trade in Guangzhou also needed to go through Hong merchants, who had a legalized monopoly on the Qing side. There's a map of these places and more on our website, ChineseRevolution.info. Until 1833, the East India Company had a corresponding monopoly on trade with China on the British side. But then the East India Company monopoly was abolished as Britain moved towards a system of free trade. When Great Britain ended the East India Company's monopoly on trade with China, they also appointed William Napier as superintendent of trade with China. The Qing prohibited on pain of death anyone teaching Chinese to foreigners. The Qing also required that imports from China be paid for in silver. Listen to the introductory episode about silver in the Qing dynasty to better understand silver's importance. In that episode, the import of silver coins from the Spanish Americas was discussed. But that flow was impacted by South American independence movements that followed Napoleon's invasion of Spain in 1808. When silver, especially the Corollas coin, was flowing from the Americas, China was receiving a big increase in silver. Between 1752 and 1800, a net 105 million silver dollars went into China. Even at the beginning of the 1800s, the flow of silver into China was positive. For example, between 1800 and 1810, 26 million in net silver arrived in China. But between 1828 and 1836, a net 38 million in silver left China. And by 1856, a net 384 million in silver had left China. What was happening? Why the big shift? As mentioned earlier in the episode on silver, the disruption of those highly recognized and valued Corollas coins was a major factor. The other main factor was opium. In the early years of the 1800s, about 4,000 chests, each with 140 pounds of opium, were sent to China annually. For example, in 1805, foreign sources document 3,159 chests sent that year. But by 1831, 20,000 chests were sent. That's almost seven times as much. By 1839, 40,000 chests. That's a further doubling in eight years and more than 10 times the average from the beginning of the 1800s. But opium imports to China actually peaked after 1852. But interestingly, by 1855, silver was also flowing into China again. From 1856 to 1886, Opium imports were very high, but net inflows of silver into China reached 691 million in the positive. Latin America had stabilized enough by then for silver coinage and production to normalize. China was then able to run a trade surplus in silver again, even at a time of record opium consumption. Opium was legal in Great Britain and grown in large quantities in British-controlled India, but it was illegal in China. The fact that it was still flowing to China in spite of its ban, tells us something important. Firstly, of course, Chinese people were using opium. It was also an important part of the economy. It provided bribery opportunities for Qing officials and was also an important source of income for Chinese merchants and workers. China also seemed to have been going through economic disruptions in the 1800s. 
possibly related to the economic shock caused by that shortage of Corollas coins by the 1830s. But for the emperor and his officials, opium was seized on as a culprit for the ills affecting the dynasty. It was seen as a cause of economic depression, disorder among the population, decrease in loyalty by soldiers and officials, and decline of the army. And of course, British consumers loved Chinese tea. The British government also had import duties on tea. So the tea trade led to important revenues for the British crown. The British government wanted the tea trade flowing, whether it was paid for by Spanish silver coins or by opium. And opium smuggling seems to have been good business for many Chinese, including the Hong merchants of Guangzhou. Hao Kua, the wealthiest of those Hong merchants, was estimated to have a fortune 10 times greater than Nathan Rothschild. Rothschild's fortune had been considerable, and at his death, his personal assets were considered to be equivalent to 0.62% of the British national income. So if that's true, then Hauqua's wealth was equivalent to 6.2% of the British annual national income. So this is the context when Britain ended the East India Company's monopoly and when William Napier was appointed superintendent of trade. Great Britain wanted freer trading rules with China and more ports to trade in instead of just one. They would also have preferred opium to be legalized in China, as it was in Britain. Missionaries also wanted China opened so that they could spread religion. Now, Napier was keen to use force on China, but his instructions from London were to use persuasion and conciliation. He ignored those instructions. Within two days of arriving in China as British superintendent, Napier broke many Chinese rules. He arrived without a passport. He took up residence in the British factory at Guangzhou without a permit. He tried to communicate directly with Qing officials in writing and not through the merchant intermediaries as required. Lu Quen was governor general of Lingguang with responsibility for the Guangdong province and Guangxi. He ordered Napier to go to Macau and to not return until he had a permit. But Napier was not cooperating. So Lu, by September 2nd, 1834, ordered British trade halted and the British factory blockaded. Napier requested reinforcements and he used two frigates to try to intimidate the Qing officials. But Lu had the defensive forts fire on the frigates and to sink Chinese boats behind the frigates. The cannon fire from the forts did kill a few British sailors and the sunken ships on the Chinese side had trapped the British frigates. However, with those two British frigates, they did take out 60 Chinese cannons. But Napier caught malaria. He abandoned the attempt to relieve the British in Guangzhou and retreated to the sea and then died from his fever. It seems like an initial victory for the Qing officials. But the disabling of the Chinese cannons by just two British ships was a foreshadowing of what was to come. Lu Quan died in office in 1835 at the age of 64. So by 1835, both Napier and Lu Quan were dead, and new officials on each side entered the story. In 1836, an opium legalization movement was active in Guangdong province. It was argued by a former judicial commissioner in Guangzhou. The new governor general of Guangdong endorsed the proposal. And this was music to the ears of the new British superintendent of trade, Charles Elliot, led by Huang Juizhi, president of the sacrificial court. Huang's memo to the emperor blamed the empire's ills on opium. Huang suggested that users be executed after a one-year chance to give up the vice. He estimated that eight or nine out of ten would give up opium. He suggested that every five households should be bound together. They would be responsible for, for reporting on any violation of the law by the other households in the group. Failure to report an offender would result in collective punishment for that whole group. Huang's estimate of the success of abstinence was, of course, wildly optimistic. He was also wrong in reporting to the emperor that opium was not consumed in the West, and he said that any Western users were bound to a stake and shot from a gun into the sea. The Dao Guang emperor was unsure how to respond. He seems to have generally been an indecisive leader. In this case, he asked for feedback and received 29 recommendations from top officials. Even then, he wasn't sure and convened a new committee 
made up of his Grand Council of Advisors. On October 25th, 1838, the emperor learned that one of the princes of the blood, along with lords, had been smoking opium in a temple in the Forbidden City in Beijing. On November 5th, 1838, the emperor learned that 130,000 ounces of opium had been seized in the port city of Tianjin, which is the closest seaport to Beijing. That was the largest seizure of opium in over 100 years, and it had been transported by Chinese merchants from Guangzhou to Tianjin. On November 9th, he invited Lin Zhe Shu, a follower of Huang, to a meeting. The emperor interviewed him on plans to eliminate the evils of opium. They met about 19 times over the next month. Each time, Lin answered confidently to the emperor's doubts. Lin said he would confiscate all opium pipes. He said that giving up opium was easy. It was just a matter of changing their minds. He recommended doing this with threats. Every opium smoker would be put on a one-year suspended death sentence. They had one year to stop, or else, execution. He recommended mass surveillance to catch smoking. And as a backup plan, he said he had once heard about a cure. If one takes that, then the very smell of opium would be repellent. By the end of that year, the emperor appointed Lin as imperial commissioner to Guangzhou. As Lin was leaving Beijing, Xi Shan, who succeeded Lin, warned Lin not to set off any frontier disturbances. Lin and the emperor never appeared to have considered foreigners when discussing their anti-opium plans. So who was Lin? Today, Mr. Lin is considered a hero in China. Lin was from southeast China. He came from a declining landholding clan. His family had not had someone pass the examination for four generations. His father had ruined his own eyesight, studying unsuccessfully for the exams and then focused on having his son pass. The son started studying the classics at age three in their broken down three-roomed apartment. At age 12, he passed the lowest level of examination. At age 19, he passed the provincial examination. And seven years later, in 1811, he succeeded in the Metropolitan Examiner's third try. He was 26 years old and had been working on this goal of passing the examination since aged three. His parents would have sacrificed much for this. While Lin could have used his new position to repair the family fortune, instead he seems to have been a paragon of hard work and virtue. When he was judicial commissioner in the Southeast, here in the name, Lin clears the heavens as testament to his incorruptibility. In 1833, Lin had expressed the belief that China should grow its own opium instead of importing it. But his main interest was to reform the grain transport system along canals. His reason for wanting success in Guangzhou is because he coveted the governorship of Jiangsu province, where the grain transportation system began. The emperor knew him and had praised him on multiple occasions before the fateful post into Guangzhou in 1839. When he arrived in Guangdong, the first thing Lin did was to organize the people into groups of five. Each person was responsible for the other four. Lin also lectured everyone that this time he would not stop until the job was done. And within two months, he had made 1,600 arrests, confiscated almost 14 tons of opium, and 43,000 opium pipes. He also met with the Hong merchants, had them kneel before him on hard ground, and lectured them on being the cause of the problem. Lin then wrote a letter to Queen Victoria that, among other things, asked her to stop opium production in her lands. In the letter, he wrote that the Qing Celestial Empire would not have won such numerous lands without superhuman power. Do not say you have not been warned, he included. Lin told the Hong merchants to order the foreigners to submit all the opium in their possessions and to sign a promise to never bring any more. If not, then both the Hong and the foreigners were to be executed. He then backed this up by having the Hong merchants deliver follow-up messages to the British with the Hong in chains. Lin was reporting proudly to the emperor. He considered his early months a success and stated to the emperor that Jardine, a wealthy British merchant, had fled upon hearing of Lin's appointment. In fact, Jardine had traveled to Great Britain and was then briefing Lord Palmerston, the foreign minister, on the situation. Lin's counterpart was Charles Elliot, the British superintendent of trade for China. Elliot was the grandson of an earl. His father was a soldier and diplomat. By 14 years old, Charles had joined the Navy. He'd also worked in the Foreign Office in British Guyana, 
and had advocated for the abolition of slavery. By 1834, he had been posted to China and was a master attendant during Napier's battles in Guangzhou. By 1836, he had been named as Napier's successor. Elliot's instructions from Lord Palmerston were contradictory and challenging. He was to avoid giving offense to the Chinese authorities, but to refuse to deal subserviently with the Chinese authorities. Elliot made clear to the opium traders that he was disgusted with their product. But Elliot also hoped that the Qing would legalize opium and then take responsibility for it. He thought that would lower prices and decrease the profit motive for British traders. Elliot noted the entire cessation of money transactions in China and therefore the need to trade opium in order to be able to buy tea. This suggests that it was the shortage of silver that was a major factor in increasing the importance of the opium trade. Elliot also asked his superiors for power to control the opium trade on the British side, which was refused. He therefore was duty-bound to protect British property and lives and to promote trade without having authority to control opium. He was unpopular with the local British traders because of his hostility to opium, and they regularly criticized him to their contacts in London and elsewhere. But he was also under orders not to offend the Chinese, but not to be subservient. This was his situation when Lin was appointed by the Qing Emperor. Elliot was in Macau when the news arrived of Lin's arrival, and Elliot put on his uniform and sailed to Guangzhou. He solicited opinions at the British factory there. The British traders' views were mixed. Some were nonplussed, others were concerned. The Hong merchants were all extremely concerned for their lives. The wealthiest, Haokua, was crushed by terrors, he said. Before Elliot's arrival, the traders had already stalled for time with vague statements. Lin was not satisfied. He threatened executions. The British suggested they could produce a thousand chests of opium. Lin was not satisfied. He issued an arrest warrant for a British smuggler named Lancelot Dent. Dent refused to leave his house. The Chinese authorities said they would wait for him. Dent offered them a bed to sleep on outside. It was a standstill. Elliot then went to Dent's house and took him under his protection. While internally, Elliot had been very critical of Dent and the opium traders. But because of his role as British representative to China, he publicly referred to Dent as one of our most respected merchants and vowed to resist aggression against persons and property. Lin responded by calling off all trade and blockaded the factories until all opium had been handed over. He gave the Chinese half an hour to get off the foreigner's property, and the place became very quiet. The 350 foreigners in the factories were blockaded by rows of Chinese ships in the water and watched continually by over a thousand armed police and soldiers on land. Even the Hong merchants were required to be part of the surveillance. But food and supplies were not an issue for the British. They had brought in supplies before the blockade. And one British trader, William Hunter, even had his breakfast and dinner delivered each day during the blockade by a translator to a Hong merchant. Three days into the siege, Elliot agreed to hand over 20,283 chests of British opium. But he told the British merchants that the Crown would take responsibility for it. With those two moves, he turned a private matter into a state matter. When news reached London six months later, this was before the telegraph had sped up communications, the government responded far more strongly to the expense than to the treatment of its nationals. So why did Elliot act this way? Why did he promise that the British crown would pay for the opium? There are different theories. He kept no diary. It seems he thought it more necessary to resolve the issue, but he wanted to buy time, to bring war at a more convenient time. Had he dug in at that moment, Lin might well have ordered an attack on the factories, and the British loss of life would have been considerable. Lin had them surrounded. So Elliot did have the opium turned over, and Lin ordered it destroyed at Humen, a small town on the coastline. The opium was mixed with salt and lime and dumped into ditches which flowed into the sea. Lin was pleased, and the emperor too. The emperor sent him a gift of roebuck meat. The Chinese name for that apparently sounds like promotion guaranteed. And Lin did indeed receive a promotion to governor general of Jiangnan and Jiangxi once matters in Guangzhou were settled.
But Lynn had imposed a second condition on Elliot above turning over the opium. The British were ordered to sign a bond pledging to never bring back opium on pain of death. When the Hong merchants brought that to Elliot, he tore it up. Elliot was not prepared to accept Chinese jurisdiction over the British population. That had been a long-standing point of contention by the British. Elliot replied to Lin that the British would not sign. Lin stood his ground and insisted that no trade could occur without the bond. Lin was of the view that the British needed tea and rhubarb more than the Chinese needed anything Britain had to trade. Now, Lin later amended his view that it was tea and not rhubarb that the British really desired. For now, the British retreated and began using a small port on the island of Hong Kong. That's about 40 miles from the mouth of the Pearl River, downstream from Guangzhou. By the way, all of these places can be found on the map on our website at ChineseRevolution.info. At that time, Hong Kong was virtually uninhabited. American and British traders had begun using it in the 1830s already, but with Lin in charge of Guangzhou, its use now increased by the English speakers. Some British sailors went inland, found some local liquor, damaged a local temple, brawled with some villagers, and killed one, whose name was Lin Wei Shi. This caused another serious problem for Elliot, since the outstanding issue was related to Chinese jurisdiction over British subjects, and now one or more of them had caused the death of a Chinese man. Elliot tried to contain the damage. He paid compensation to the family of the deceased, as well as a small further amount to the villagers. The family provided him with a document that said the death was an accident and not willful. But Lin heard of it and sent investigators. He got many details and posted a notice in Macau demanding that the killer come forward for punishment. Elliot had no intention of having the Chinese judge Britons. He instead improvised a trial for all the sailors who had been involved. It wasn't clear who had struck the final blow, so five were found guilty of indictment of riot and assault. Later, those convictions were set aside in London, where it was determined that Elliot had no jurisdiction to try them. He had no authority as court or judge. But in any event, this trial and this conviction was not satisfactory to Lin. He ordered all Chinese to stop working with the British in Macau. Macau did have a Portuguese colony since 1557, but Portugal did not have full control over Macau until 1849. Lin also had signs posted around Hong Kong and Kowloon, which is across the harbor from Hong Kong Island, saying that the wells had been poisoned. Lin also had 2,000 troops sent to a station 40 miles north of Macau. Things were getting tense. British women and children left Macau and boarded ships that then anchored off Hong Kong. Lin seemed to have the upper hand. He was also trying to understand the British and even had a piece of Swiss international law translated. But Lin also underestimated them. In a report to the emperor that spring, Lin wrote that they are the minority, we are the majority. Their ships were strong and their guns quick, but they could only be victorious at sea. They cannot play their tricks in port and Guangzhou was well fortified. Lin thought that the smugglers could be easily destroyed by fire rafts or by hiring local militia. Lin also said that the British were not skilled at infantry engagements. Their legs and feet were also bounded by tight trousers, which makes bending and stretching inconvenient. When they reach shore, thus they are powerless and can be controlled. Even when news of an arriving British fleet came to his attention, Lin dismissed it as rumors. He told the emperor that it was only a large smuggling operation. Now, communication between Lin and the emperor was very slow. By the time Lin's dismissal of the rumors reached Beijing, the British had already controlled Zhou Shan by Shanghai for 12 days. We'll discuss that more later. The Qing didn't seem to have considered Britain to be any different than any of the other barbarian nations. Lin doesn't seem to have considered the longer-term response his actions would cause among the British. The emperor was keen for him to finish up in Guangzhou and to move on to his next assignment. But instead, war was coming. Neither Lin nor the emperor was prepared for what came next. <laughs>